Okay, this is Dog Days of Podcasting Day 4, and I'm back around to the first show of the cycle. However, I am mulling over whether I'll definitely have time for an hour drama, for which I also do a bit of research beyond filmography of a cast member. I'm ahead of the game for now, but if it eventually comes down to watching, writing, recording, and editing for a same-day release, and that show that day is Rockford, it might not be the way that I go. I did realize I do still have a stock of backup material from the past that I can repurpose. It's not fully recorded and produced like really big things, but still, should I find myself without a full show episode in only a little time, I might need to trot it out. Today, I'm trying to get this episode out in the middle of the day. Darcy and I are going out for a Duluth Huskies baseball game tonight, and I'd like to avoid a late night recording session afterwards. Hi there, I'm Paul Mackey, and Idget on a Roll. Things are back in full swing here, and I'm moving on to the actual non-pilot first episode of The Rockford Files. This episode aired on NBC September 13th, 1974, Friday night at 9, 8 central. The lead-in show was Chico and the Man, and it was airing against the CBS Friday night movie and the last half hour of The Six Million Dollar Man, followed by The Texas Wheelers on ABC. The episode title is The Kirkoff Case, and I'm going to go watch it and get back to you instantaneously later. The first thing I noticed was Abe Vigoda in the pre-show teaser. Apparently, he was not a big enough name to feature in top-of-show credits. Oh, and speaking of credits, the credits are intact on this episode, by which I mean the syndication cut-down pilot credits had some live footage edited in to cover any images of Rocky as played by Noah Beery Jr., The clips had seemed odd before, and now I can see why they were there. I would love to see how the movie opening looked before the syndication, but I imagine that is lost or very difficult to find. Brief summary. When the episode starts out, Jim is following a cowboy. After flirting with a girl on a remote section of beach, he accepts the offer of a drink at her place up the road, but it turns out she is in cahoots with the cowboy and slips Rockford a mickey. Rockford is on a case for Larry Kirkhoff, played by James Woods, looking for his parents' killer, though Kirkhoff is generally thought to be that killer, as far as everyone from the press to the police believe. This is Jim Rockford. At the tone, leave your name and message. I'll get back to you. Jim, it's Norma at the market. It bounced. You want us to tear it up, send it back, or put it with the others? Who is? I mentioned Abe Vigoda earlier, and the other prominent guest star who actually did score a top-of-show credit was James Woods, but I don't think I need to go too far into either of those gentlemen. The female lead guest star was Julie Summers, who did lots of guest spots through the 80s before settling in for 95 episodes of Matlock. Today, however, I'm going to go into the series creator Roy Huggins. Roy started out as a novelist, but when one of his novels was optioned by Columbia, he entered into a contract to adapt it, and then he transitioned into showbiz. He was a writer with Columbia until 1955, and then moved to Warner Brothers as a producer, where his most notable works included creating Maverick with James Garner, 77 Sunset Strip, and The Fugitive. In 1960, he was hired at 20th Century Fox as VP of TV Production, then moved to the same role at Universal Television a couple of years later. There, he produced shows like The Virginian and Beretta, and created The Rockford Files. Huggins and co-creator Stephen J. Cannell wrote Rockford as a modern-day version of Brett Maverick, written specifically for James Garner, based on Huggins' previous program with Garner, Maverick. Cannell and Huggins wrote many of the first season's stories, but eventually Huggins was forced out. It seems he was doing rewrites on an episode during shooting and rushed the pages to set. James Garner had trouble working out what was going on, and it turned out nobody in production had any idea there were new script pages, and nobody on the team had reviewed them. Huggins had a practice of writing under the name John Thomas James once he was also a studio executive, and Mr. James had his last story by credit on Season 1, Episode 19. He did move on later in the 80s to write episodes of Hunter and got a taste of all of the derivative works from his earlier creations, the Maverick movie with Mel Gibson, the Fugitive movie with Harrison Ford, the U.S. Marshals movie with Tommy Lee Jones, and many others. He passed away of natural causes in 2002 at age 87. All right, the This Aged Poorly section. Again, lots of smoking and somewhat poor attitude towards women, but nothing as blatant as that line in the pilot. And now we'll move into totally 70s. 
I guess I'll go with that cedar shake paneling at Tonya Baker's apartment. I'm not sure what's going on there. It looks like an exterior wall covering, but they're indoors. I know the 1970s never saw wood paneling it didn't like, but I don't think I've ever seen that kind of paneling indoors. Was that just the whim of the set designer, or some trend that never took off beyond California beachside apartments? The Artifactoids. I doubt it was visible on 1974 television, but the article about the Greens going to the Greek Isles reads, in part, future plans will of necessity have great bearing on the situation as it now stands. Decisions will have to be made of the actual planning of the project will take considerable time, but it is felt that these steps are very important. This slug text is from Earl Hayes Press and is also found in a common prop newspaper seen in everything from The Goonies to Married with Children to that 70s show. And also the Tokarev 7.62mm semi-automatic pistol is a real gun of Soviet origin. It was hard to tell from the quick cutaway shot at the golf course, but the prop gun depicted really is a Tokarev. All right, what worked? The mystery was fun, but what I really enjoyed in this episode was watching Rockford's 70s-style social engineering hacking, gaining access at the tennis club, first by getting past the gate with mail for Mr. Smith, then by finding reference to club members who were most definitely out of town. I also enjoyed James Woods as a spoiled brat. What didn't work? Well, I don't know if I'd say that it didn't work exactly, but I was disappointed that the pilot was so full of interesting real locations in Los Angeles, and as soon as it went to series, it appears the locations have become fictional. For example, online, the only references to the owl in Turtle point either to a San Francisco restaurant of that name or to the Rockford Files. Next time, the episode will be The Dark and Bloody Ground. Happy hunting! You have been listening to the One Idget's Thoughts On podcast, produced by Paul Mackey in association with QuadrupleZ.com. Theme music is Too Good by Jack Mangan and is used by permission from him. If you would like to hear other podcasts by me, you might try The Ghostlight Podcast, a completed intro cast about the TV series Slings and Arrows, or Idget Cast, an intro cast for the TV series Supernatural. Both can be found on fine podcasting listening software everywhere or at quadruplez.com. So, 1974 standards and practices were cool with Beat the Poo Out of Me? I wonder if that was edgy at the time.